welcome. What a great crowd. Um, so nice to have you all here as we, it's sort of, even though it's uh, the end of September, we still have that back to school feeling here at Roosevelt House. And what an extraordinary event, educational, broadcast, et cetera, and literary, brings us together this evening because we're in the midst of what can only be called a cultural phenomenon with all the roiling disputes about Civil War memory and with the um, current crisis around Korea. Everyone seems to be, not to mention football and the national anthem, everyone seems to be talking again uh, about Vietnam and about the Vietnam experience. And that's because so many Americans, so many New Yorkers seem to be spending their their evening hours watching the 18-hour uh, documentary. It will be at the end uh, of, the, of the series um, about a shooting war abroad and a political war at home um, that many of us have tried to forget rather than remember over the decades. And of course, I mean the Ken Burns, Lynn Novick series, uh, The Vietnam War. Before we talk about it with the man who wrote the script and wrote the book, um, let's look at a brief clip so that we're all in that Burnsian sensibility mood. So my first question, we're going to talk mostly about process tonight. We don't the fight um, or the debate, but you can ask what you want when it's your turn to be sure. My first question is, and this is asked with a combination of admiration and awe, incomprehensibility. How on earth, going over the just the Ken Burns um, history, how on earth do you know so much about baseball, jazz, the Civil War, <laughs> Vietnam, and the Roosevelts? It's not possible, is it? I, I know nothing about baseball, to begin with. <laughs> that was entirely made up. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I've always been interested in a lot of things, and Ken is... Um, <clears throat> Sorry, a wonderfully adventurous filmmaker, and uh, Roosevelt is my own problem, but um, I, I just always got very intensely interested in things, and they, they come and go a little. I, if you ask me questions about the history of the West, which I wrote many years ago, I would flunk. I would flunk my own test. So, But uh, I, I don't know, I've just always been interested in a lot of things. But how, how do you know everything there is? that ever happened during the Civil War? Because I don't know anything about jazz or the American West. Ah. I keep it very narrow. Fair enough. Um, but I think you know as much about the Civil War as no, I do. I um, <laughs> how immersive is the process? So, you, uh, How long did Vietnam take? What was, how did I you get everything else out of your mind, obviously, is, is, is crucial. Ken has a very colorful view of how hard all this is. And I think it's hard, too. Um, he thinks it's 10 years. I think it's six, maybe. And very intensively, for when I was doing the book, the last two years, where I never want to go through an experience like that again. Um, I really came to this. First of all, it's the only thing I've ever written about that happened, or written seriously about, that happened during my lifetime. Mm -hmm. And you think you know things because you read the newspaper. The newspaper is not even the first draft of history. It's some stuff that happened. And it takes a lot of work and a lot of scholarship, and then me working on, with all that scholarship, trying to make a new narrative out of it. Um, and I, you know, I before I was through, I had a thousand books on Vietnam, all of which went to the Strand. It's one of the great moments <laughs> in my life. They all, they all went out several months ago in a big truck. But um, you just have to kind of hurl yourself into it. And on this one, uh, I've never worked as hard. It's also, I'm a lot older than I was when I took on all those other things. Um, it just takes, a, you get obsessed. A process question. Mm -hmm. Do you write the script as you write the book? No. I write the script, and then, uh, and then I remember all the things I wished I'd been able to do in the script, and those all go in the book. So no, nothing ends up on the cutting room floor if I can help it. 
Um, I think that's Ken's theory, too. <laughs> yeah, well, there's that. Um, uh, no, it, I try, but I try to see them as different things. I hope the books are not just illustrated programs for the, mm -hmm. for the show, and they are treated that way by reviewers, uh, especially in the in New York Times a couple of weeks ago, where they, that was an unusual review. But um, no, I, I think they're, leg I, I try to make them legitimate books. I hope I, hope I succeed. Do you? Rem I mean, one more process question. Mm -hmm. Hold on, just I may sure. be the only one interested in this, but I am deeply interested in it. <laughs> Do you remember the script lines, the key lines, and move them into the bound volume if you can? I, I'm just curious about whether you, I can't you remember hold anything. Script. Now, Ken, with whom I worked for 34 years, can recite every script we've ever done. I wrote most of them. I can't remember anything. So. But uh, yeah, the the thing in the the introduction that you just saw, um, the sort of overall overarching introduction is exactly in the book. In yeah. fact, it has several pages devoted to it with a picture on each. Thing. Right. Um, and I, we've done that every time. And then there are some lines that that survive. Um, it's very different. I mean, anybody here who's written, I don't know if anybody here has written for film, but it's like writing haiku. You you. You say it, and then you remove things. Yeah. And you keep removing them, and you keep removing them, because the pictures provide, the to there are no topic sentences in a script. Because the picture, or almost always, because the picture provides it. Um, and goodness knows Peter Coyote speaks very slowly. And very clearly. Yes, he does. And he's not terrified by very long sentences with lots of clauses and commas. So he's my man. <laughs> Don't attack Peter Coyote. He's I'm just great. saying, it 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 makes it it makes you take out more if he's going to. Speak yeah, it does. A it pace. does. But you also listen to him. Yeah. And you hear every line. So, um, yeah. I mean, the, this the series, the book, the series has been getting an extraordinary amount of attention since I wrote these questions. I don't know if you all saw this, but an entire page of letters to the New York Times on, I think it was Sunday, was devoted to the series. And um, it's been criticized. The point of view has been criticized right and left, although we can discuss where most of the criticism mm -hmm. is coming. A lot of us, I guess, is that first line or that, that big line in the, in the introduction started by men of good faith. So, so Decent men. Decent men. Yeah. I think that's true. I think Dwight Eisenhower was a decent man. I think the people in the Kennedy administration who started out genuinely believed that was the thing to do. They had, um, so this is an obsession of mine, but we all, especially anybody who's interested in history, we all really believe that, or try often, that uh, those who uh, don't, do not learn history are doomed to mm -hmm. repeat it. I think that's nonsense. I think people need to study history to see how people act, but that's very different from repetition. And what's astonished to me when I was reading about the, the thinking that went into the beginning decisions, how much of it was from people who had fought in World War II and who knew that Munich had been a terrible thing and that if you allow the dictator to make his move, Mm -hmm. All hell breaks loose. Ho Chi Minh was not <laughs> was not Hitler, and those those parallels, which were very important to very smart people, including people my father knew and that I knew a little bit, uh, they were just wrong. And and that's that's what I mean about learning from history. You can't you can learn some things from history, but you can't. It doesn't. Mark Twain, I think it's Mark Twain, said. Um, History doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. <laughs> and I, I, as usual, Mark Twain said it better than anybody else. And we're still drawing lines in the sand anyway. Yeah. Well, yeah. Whether it's Syria or Korea. <laughs> oh, sure. So what do you make of the reaction? I, I know well, it's been, I mean, it's been amazing. I, we don't know the numbers yet, but they're very, very good. And uh, I'm less interested in the actual numbers than just in how much conversation it's produced and how many articles... Um, I had expected to be attacked much more. We knew it was going to be controversial. Um, uh, I expected to be attacked from the right 
from people who felt, especially from veterans who felt that they had fought in a noble cause and, and that people didn't understand it here and that they'd been betrayed in Washington and so on. There's a lot of that. I, we've had very little of that. Um, uh, what surprises me, mainly because it's my friends as opposed to those folks, uh, is that there is some hostility on the left. Um, uh, some of it is, I think, <coughs> just, sorry, just because um, people are so opposed to it and realized what a horror it was that anybody who was involved in any decision making must have been an evil, wicked person. And I, I don't believe that. Um, uh, you can hear, Bob Carroll is here and he knows this better than anyone in the world. There is nothing quite like listening to Lyndon Johnson agonize over anything, but especially over this. I mean, we, we do him as much as we, I, if, if it were up to me, there would be three more hours of Lyndon Johnson on the phone. Mm -hmm. um, but those are serious people struggling with this. And, 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 and to me, it's a sort of Shakespearean tragedy to hear all that. And to just assume that they're all evil and wicked strikes me as dumb. Um, and I have, I, I, I've come to know Todd Gitlin, who was one of the founders of SDS. Um, and he's wonderful about the film. I mean, he was a, you know, he has, all, he has all those views, and he still was very moved by it and has mm -hmm. publicly given an inter interview to the nation, whose readers probably don't share that view, um, you know, saying that, it's a, that, that we have been fair, and uh, I hope we have. I, that was certainly our intention. That's different from being balanced, which is what somehow the press got a hold of, that somehow we were trying to produce some equivalent thing. That's not what you do when you write history. You try to write what happened. Um, I think Ken and Lynn have sort of fallen into that a little bit. They get You know, if you get interviewed thousands of times, you begin to say the same, same things over and over again. Um, I certainly never sat down and said, now we must, we must be balanced here. I wanted to find out what was happening in that scene. Right. By the way, if you read the letters, the Sunday letters, which I'm obsessing about a bit, but of course we don't know how the Times filtered them or chose them, but the ones from servicemen were all remorseful about their participation in the experience rather than the, you know, the, the, well, the bad welcomes home, and et cetera. So that, yeah. I thought that was illuminating. So you've opened up... Um, a conversation that, in a way, has been has been repressed by yeah, mutual had, consent for a long time. We had we had some of that on the war, the World War II series that we did. There were veterans who, for the first time, talked to their grandchildren about mm -hmm. the war, and much more of that is happening now with this. People suddenly are, I mean, if you believe emails and twitters and so on, um, people write, you know, and say, "My my dad never talked about it." But now he's, we've had a conversation, and I understand why he does certain things and why his life seems to seem to have changed. And so uh, that's, I think, a, a service we perform. We actually have a couple of uh, friends, very good Lincoln friends, who are highly decorated Vietnam veterans mm -hmm. with whom we never discuss this. So I think this is sort of the wedge to conversations that have been I delayed. Hope so. I yeah, so. I will let you know if that works because yeah. it'll right. it'll happen at the Lincoln Forum in November. So one one process piece I wanted to ask you about, um, because for all of our um, comments about the Ken Burns formula of documentary filmmaking, there's something different here, and that is there are different kinds of talking heads. Let's say let's say. Um, we don't have a Shelby Foote, as we did in the Civil War, speaking from on high, or Barbara Fields, for that matter. Um, we don't have uh, Buck O'Neill becoming a, a, an overnight star for the second time in his life on baseball. Right. What, was the what was the process that went into the decision to do grunts? I mean, Max Cleland, not John Kerry. I could, you know, I could go on, but there seems to be 
aside from journalists. No, there were no a, analysts. That was a deliberate decision. Um, if you have witnesses who really were in it and saw it, they're more compelling than people who teach it. That's just true. Um, uh, and, and, and surviving politicians defend whatever they did for the most part. Now, right. um, what's his name, Gelb, in the show, uh, is partly in there because he's so honest about how wrong he was. And that, that, that's interesting. He gives you a real sense of what it was like to be in the Pentagon when the demonstrations were outside or, or when, when uh, McNamara asked him to work on the Pentagon Papers and he saw the papers for the first time. That's not the same thing as Henry Kissinger defending whatever he feels he needs to defend. And so we didn't do that. And there was no thought of trying to get him? None. Okay. None. None. And we didn't ask Kerry about the war, and we didn't ask McCain about the war either. And they understood that. McCain, both of them are, are, have been wonderful about urging people to watch this. They come at it from, God knows, very different positions. Um, but they respect one another. So if you view this as a long, as part of a long line in the Burns-Ward partnership in exploring <laughs> these catharses, these tribulations that are convulsive in nature, they, they, are, they manifest in war, um, beginning with the Civil War. Was there any thought that this was ever given to the fact that this was too soon? I mean, 60 years is not... A short time, as much time as elapsed or as between uh, the Civil War and World War I, but... I don't think we, I don't think, I would have been the most likely to say that because I'm oldest. <laughs> you know, they're all 10 or 20 years younger than I am. Um, and I thought it was a good idea to do it. I, I didn't, I have an almost, I think I've talked about this before here, but I have an almost unbroken record of giving Ken bad advice. I told him <laughs> the Civil War was a terrible idea. I couldn't imagine why anybody would want to watch all those hours on baseball. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm, this is not a, I'm not a good source. But on this one, I thought it was a good idea. Um, a thread that runs, among many threads that runs through the, the first four episodes is that of secrecy. Um, misinformation, disinformation. It seems to me a really hard thing to portray in a film. How do you pierce well, secrecy, much less portray secrecy? It's complicated because there's this awful secrecy and people in Washington increasingly understanding that this thing is hopeless. And at the same time, there's very little censorship. So you're seeing the horror of it while they're telling you everything's great. <laughs> it's a very strange schizophrenic period. And, because we uh, don't see that much. No, uh, they, no the, the, the military learned thereafter. We weren't going to have the shot of the, all the coffins coming off the right. plane. Um, or and, let Morley safer in. Yeah, to, and, and you know, people are now embedded, which is very different from yeah. roaming the battlefield. I mean, the footage in this thing is astounding. Just astounding. And it's interesting, you know, young people, uh, I, I have just learned how to look at Twitter. It was a big moment in my life. And uh, I did it for the show, just because... It, because Will you show me after? The, because the other... <laughs> I'm not there yet. <laughs> because the other people, of course, are all on Twitter. And uh, there are people who write in saying things like, who are the videographers? They're fantastic. <laughs> you know... There, there's a, there are a whole generation of, of filmmakers, who, who many of whom died, to, to make this stuff, and you you can see them. In you the, list the casual, the, you yeah, announce the, the casualties yeah, yeah, yeah. in journal of journalists. In the Tet Offensive, you can watch those guys. You know, some people are carrying guns, and some people are carrying cameras, and they're weaving in and out of those streets with at the, around the embassy and so on. It's amazing. That stuff is uh, large. Do we gone. know how many millions of feet? Exist. I mean, I, I have no idea. But it's a you obviously winnowed down or can't we did, and Lynn, it winnowed down. It may not seem as if we winnowed down, but we did <laughs> winnow down. <laughs> the con, by the way, the conceit at the beginning, whose ever idea it was to show so stuff, bombs so stuff going back, going backwards, was just brilliant. And that's Ken's, that was Ken's idea from the 
almost from the first day, he said, I know what we're going to do. And he worked on it and worked. And that, I, that must have taken three months of work to do what you saw. Even De Gaulle marching backwards. Yeah, you have even to, De Gaulle managing to march backwards. Yeah. <laughs> and, it, and the flames, the napalm going in. It's just, it sort of invites and the, you inside. And, and the cops you in back, Chicago backing, backing off, the, off demonstrators the demonstrators. And so, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. It's wishful thinking. It's all the things you wish had yeah. happened. Yeah. Now, what interests me is it works. We weren't sure it was going to work with people young enough not to recognize those shots. For those of us who lived through it, Every one of those is an iconic piece of footage, pretty much. And, uh, but it works for kids, too. Uh, my grandson watched it. He's never seen any of that. How old? He's 19. Oh, okay. Um, back to the talking heads for a moment. Yeah. Because I think one of the most extraordinary experiences that we're having is seeing North Vietnamese veterans. Mm. Because we may have seen the footage, but the footage was always wrapped around American-only explanation, defense, whatever, defensive situations. Here are people who are, they're pained, but they're also very proud. And in some cases, they're they want sort of jolly. Yeah. 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 I mean, where, where on earth did these they're people not, come from? I they're mean, not actually, I'm glad you said that. They're not actually jolly. It is a feature, uh, I found, of Vietnamese culture to smile. And you smile even when things are sad. So sometimes when they're, when they're beaming and you say, and, and some guy is talking about shooting Americans, and you think that SOB, but actually he, he's simply being polite. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, that was a surprise to me too. There was no way to put a thing saying merely polite. <laughs> <laughs> or not grinning because of yeah, hubris. Right. But again, this is probably beyond the screenwriter's um, purview. But where uh, are these people veterans who make appearances in in no. Vietnam? I mean, well, uh, you know, some of them are. I mean, Baudin, whom we saw here, the man right. with the sort of cockatoo hair, is um, wrote a superb novel. Uh, he was the first. He was the first uh, veteran in Vietnam to publish a novel, the name of which I've forgotten. The word sorrow is in the title, not surprisingly. He was in the Central Highlands and he was there for years. Um, but no, they were found for us. Um, Lynn Novick and <coughs> Sarah Botstein went to Vietnam. I did not go to Vietnam. And um, the government was very cooperative. They had a very bright guy here who was their head of mission at the UN, who sort of thought the story should be really told. And there are interviews that are, um, <clears throat> we were afraid we were going to get the standard line, you know, which 10 years ago you would have gotten, in which it was a glorious revolution, we won every battle, you were fascist, you know, uh, that. And it wasn't like that. There are people, there are people like that, but um, these people really talked, um, very straight with us, I think, and um, and there are there's a a famous incident that was in the last show, which was what happened at Hue when the when the North Vietnamese left, uh, and they left and they massacred almost three thousand people. It became almost a, a guarantee that if you were in a certain part of the anti-war movement. You did not believe that. Noam Chomsky wrote a whole book about how it wasn't true. It was true. And we have two people talking about having participated in it. And for them to have confided that in us uh, was a testament, first of all, to Lynn's extraordinary ability to interview people. And then the general feeling that we ought to all tell what really happened. And I think people on all three sides do that. Mm. And, and the Chomsky narrative is probably attributable in part to the credibility gap that existed while we were living through this, that we were deluded so many times that every official report sure. was held to question. And that's sure, sure. what you seem to be sorting 
sorting through here. Yeah. Um, the other thread that I've learned the most from, I guess, is the reminder um, that aside from the, the American theory of war, the domino effect, stopping communist aggression, etc., the the thread that deserves the most attention and should be renewed as a matter as a course of inquiry is the colonial part of the story um, and the footage of the French period yeah. all the way up to Yen Yen Fu is. I wish we could have done more of that. I, it fascinates me. Is is um, is there a, a parallel? Not suggesting for a moment that history repeats itself, heaven help me, but, but we're having a battle in the United States about historical memory mm. and images, obviously, of a much stiller and less evocative form, but a powerful form in icons. Is the, the fact that we've rejected the colonial theory mostly in our history? Uh, I don't quite know what you mean by rejecting nor the do colonial I. theory. Well, <laughs> I'll rephrase. Okay. We haven't emphasized re re rebellion against colonialism as a motivating factor for the revolution that began in the North. It's a thread that runs through. Mm -hmm. Is it now going to have equal status in the discussion? Is this a battle against the French and other occupiers, including the Americans? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And it's also a civil war. It's a lot of things. It's a proxy war in which we were involved. It's a civil war between North and South, um, and, it's a, and it's a revolution. And the other Both part. From, and it's a revolution from the North and within the South. Right. I think that point is really and I hope, I hope made. we made that clear. You it's did. very complicated. It is. It's mm -hmm. extremely complicated. Um, and the other part that was, I had to be reminded about was the Buddhist versus Catholic Buddhist majority versus Catholic minority. I had sort of forgotten that uh, the president and Madame Nu and all of those folks were Catholics and they were yep. holding the tide against the Buddhist majority. Yep. But that's it's another not actually It's not actually quite a Buddhist majority, I learned. It's a, but it, that's the largest body of religion. But it, there are various sects and so on. It's, it's lots of fun to write about <laughs> trying, to, trying to get them all in. And you had more room to do that in the book. Obviously. In the book, yes. Yeah. But, and it's still inadequate. So. But the, the suicides are pretty vivid. On oh, television. God. Yeah, it's yeah. just, yeah. Horrible. No, I, I, there's a scene uh, in the book. Um, I think it was the same day. Somebody will check me here. I think it was the same day that, Wa that Wallace stood in the, in the door at, at Alabama. I think this mm -hmm. is right. I think this is right. And Robert Kennedy was looking into that and had called his brother, and his brother was in bed, still in bed. And as they were talking on the phone, Kennedy looked over at the, the bedside table, and there was the newspaper, and it had a picture of a burning monk on the front, and he, sh he shouted, "Oh shit!" And that's <laughs> that's how we learned about the Buddhist the Buddhist uprising. I guess the thing the thing that is to me was most, it's not that I didn't know it, but it's just to hear it is discouraging, is how little people knew about Vietnam. Just how incredibly little they knew. While it was unfolding. Yeah. yeah. I mean, when they sent those first uh, advisors, not one of them spoke Vietnamese. Nobody in the embassy spoke Vietnamese. Um, and we have an, um, a recording, which I guess you all have heard, yeah, you've heard in 66, uh, we've been in for a year, in which the Secretary of Defense is on the phone with the President, Johnson, and he says, oh, by the way, it's absolutely by the way, he says, by the way, uh, a British historian was in here yesterday, he's an ex British expert on Southeast Asia, and he says that in the, that in effect, the important person in the Politburo is a man named Lee 
Duan, he says, which is not how you pronounce it. And then he spells it for the president. As far as I know, president, the president never said that name again. And that's the man. We should have known that that was the enemy. Instead, we thought it was Ho Chi Minh. Focus Ho Chi Minh was, the, was involved. It was a figurehead and so on. But just the idea that you can go to war and not know and who not the enemy is. Now, not know. luckily, people are much wiser now in the White House, and so we'll be sure we, they have a full and deep understanding of the rest of the world. So speaking of the White House, yeah. thank you for that segue. No president goes uh, unexamined, mm. being generous and, uh, about that. And I just want to give everyone a chance to hear capsule descriptions of what went wrong with each. And we, we talked a bit before we came downstairs about Wilson and a moment that might Woodrow Wilson yeah. and Hull. Could you just tell everyone yeah, that well, story? In, and in, this uh, goes back quite a while. During the peace talks in Paris at the end of World War I, uh, Ho Chi Minh, uh, who had been in exile for a long time, and among other places, he had lived in Brooklyn, Brooklyn Heights, and he had uh, been a pastry chef at the uh, Parker House in Boston during his travels. Uh, he, um, he represented a tiny group of uh, uh, Vietnamese intellectuals who had put together a, not demands, but a request that their wishes be recognized in the peace. It's not a demand that for independence. It was nothing even as grand as that, uh, which, he, which he carried to all the sort of all the Allied leaders, including Woodrow Wilson. He tried to see Wilson. He was sent away. Wilson was out uh, looking at battlefields in Belgium that day with his wife. And uh, uh, that was the beginning of, of his trying to enlist us in some way. Um, he knew that FDR took a very dim view of the French, and he greatly hoped that Roosevelt would, would when the war ended, um, end that empire, or help end that empire. Roosevelt died. Truman hadn't a clue about the French empire, and uh, it became ensnarled in the, in the Cold War. Um, so does Eisenhower think, you've, you've You've made short trip to Truman, which is fine. Eisenhower thinks, does he think he can create a DMZ that would hold as yeah, he in thought, Korea? Yeah, he thought, uh, he thought Korea would happen again. And so they were going to draw another line and keep them up there, them. And he, he's the author of the domino theory. Mm -hmm. You can hear him do it in the film. Um, he had some good and lines, he Eisenhower, invested, by the way. Oh, huh? the, Eisenhower came up with some really good lines during his he presidency did. that he gets credit for belatedly. <laughs> right. He, Military industrial complex is not bad yeah. either. He, um, uh, he decides not to intervene at Yen Bin Phu, though we are paying, I think it's 80% 80 of the French uh, defense during that war. Which must have horrified him, a general who knew oh, how to he fight and knew it. where to fight. What a st I mean, as opposed he, to being in a bowl. Oh, yeah. I mean, he just, as soon as he saw that in his diary, he, he wrote, and said, there is no possible victory here. But he was not the last one to know that and carry on. Right. Um, and then Kennedy came in. He did not intervene in Laos. So he felt he had to do something. So he was going to hold the line in Vietnam. Like Truman, a combat veteran. And, I mean, yeah. Yeah, lower level. The sad thing with him is level. that he had a a better sense than most people of the importance of colonial of, of uh, colonial aspiration. We use a piece, a very unfamiliar piece of his of his uh, inaugural in the film, in which you hear him appeal directly to people um, who are just becoming free and reminding them that it, they mustn't ride the tiger. Because um, you wind up inside. Yeah, because you'll end up inside. But also that you know we're on your side and and so on. But then when when he got into office, um, he fell into the same thing. The thing that's interesting with him is how he tries to keep his options open as long as possible. Um, he keeps not doing things. And you, 
You. <laughs> Only Ambassador Van Den Heuvel can get away with this. Uh, yeah, I, I, he's forgiven anything. He is. I'm glad the power is wearing down from my. <laughs> um, Kennedy is you you you. Um, let, let me just say we have a very good piece in the book by Fred Logaval mm -hmm. on what Kennedy would have done. Yeah, it's a standard. I mean, ever there's a horror books written about it. His, his view, he's very careful, he's writing a book about Kennedy now, which I'm sure will be a good book. He's a very bright guy. And um, his, his general feeling was that Kennedy would have kept his options open longer than Johnson would have, that he would have found it sending, a, sending actual troops in there, combat troops, he thinks is unlikely. But he's very careful, he's very careful in the case he makes. You can't you can't prove it one way or another. Well, you make the case in the, in the script as well as the book that Kennedy had two things going that Johnson didn't have. One is that he feared he was facing a very close election in 1964. Mm -hmm. And second, he was coming out of a very successful, if frightening, for a 14-year-old, uh, <laughs> right. brinksmanship triumph with the Russians in, in Cuba. So it was a slightly different... I mean, yeah. how did that... How do you calculate that, that, it, that looming election against Goldwater? He thought it would be Goldwater. How did that inflect his, his view and his leadership? Well, I think he thought he had to, he had to be tough or seem tough as long as, as long as necessary. And I think he didn't think he could do much until after the election. What he would have done after that election, I don't know. Um, but you've got that extraordinary voice memorandum about how appalled he is about the yeah, assassination. And, how, and he blames leaders. himself. And, and if there's another president that I can remember in my lifetime who actually blamed himself for something, I don't know who it is. But well, there it was only is. to the tape recorder. But yeah, but yeah. still, I was, it, you know, it's a, it's a fascinating document, that thing. It's actually, we had to edit it. It's actually interrupted by Caroline coming in. Uh -huh. And so there's a little murmuring with her, but it was too hard to explain what was happening. Um, and then Johnson, you know, he knew this country. He did not know the rest of the world, and especially didn't know anything about Asia. And so he was in the hands of, of um, all those Kennedy experts. Yeah, he kept, I, oh, Can I just tell a quick story? Sure. My mother was a uh, sort of, at least in the circles in which we live, was a sort of uh, pioneer anti-war person. She, we lived in Greenwich, Connecticut. She was the chairman of Fair Housing in Connecticut. If you can imagine a more thankless job, in, and 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 dem Democratic chairman in Greenwich, which is even more depressing. But anyway, um, at some point, she decided she wanted to find out what was happening in Vietnam, and she was very skeptical from the first. We'd spent a long time in Asia when we were when I was young. My dad was the vice president at the Ford Foundation. Uh, for um, uh, first had been in India, then was doing Africa and Asia and so on. And Matt Bundy was in charge of the Ford Foundation. So my mother asked Dad to go to the office and ask him if he could recommend some books. This must have been 66 maybe, um, for her to read. Because she assumed that if that he would have some books supporting the effort, he couldn't recommend any. He sent her a long book list. I still have it at home, and it's um, it's all books saying we should get the hell out of there. Mm -hmm. So even he, you know, had done some reading, and uh, Bernard Fall and all those people, and um, so. It, but as Johnson says in his in that conversation with with Richard Russell, it's a hell of a fix. It's a hell right? of a fix. He doesn't know how to get. And we yeah. should acknowledge formally. It's very hard to discuss Lyndon Johnson um, in front of the great man who's sitting over here, it's actually, Robert Caro. It's actually terrifying. So it's terrifying. <laughs> okay. So what did Johnson do to educate himself since? Did Mac Bundy give him any books? You don't know. They all tried. I mean, they all, 
listening to that fall apart and the whole business, I, this, a lot of this is not in the film, but the whole role of Clark Clifford and trying to manipulate him and so on is, is uh, we look forward to really reading about it, but um, it is, it's absolutely fascinating stuff. I mean, it, Shakespearean is inadequate to describe that White House to me. I just, he's such an admirable and such an awful person at once. <laughs> he's just fascinating. And then Nixon is Nixon. Is that all and you want to There's no, well, it's interesting. Johnson, for all his flaws, I'm just talking about process now. Right. For all his flaws, I, I literally can listen to Lyndon Johnson all day. I don't even care who he's talking to. I need to know sort of what the bill is or what it is. And after that, you just, it's opera. Um, listening to Nixon is profoundly depressing. It, there's, there is no admirable person there, or at least not on those recordings. He's just cynical, mean-spirited, insincere, um, desperately insecure, posing as a tough guy when he's obviously terrified all the time. And I, it, it, he's repellent. He really is. And he's also... Um, Treasonous, I think. I think that 1968 business is mm -hmm. treasonous. And um, you mean his interfering, his creating the back channel? Yeah, his his scuttling talks um, in Paris, which you know the talks might have gone nowhere, but the idea that you do that in order to get elected and then make the people go to the talks, which he did ten minutes later because Johnson caught him. Uh, it's loathsome, loathsome. And to see, um, just as I was finishing the book, we have a page in the book, which is just Halderman's notes. Uh, and you can see him, you know, says, uh, monkey wrench, throw a monkey wrench into peace talks. You know, I mean, it's something, you're really sorry that that didn't come out earlier. Yeah. And that the smoking gun, which has just been discovered, wasn't, uh, wasn't available sooner. I think I'd love to give you all a chance to ask some questions before we all go up and get the book. Let's start in the back because you had your hand up first. The gentleman. Yes. Hi, thank you very much. When you were uh, talking to the Vietnamese uh, representative that appear on the uh, show, did you find anyone that was uh, willing to say that from the Vietnam perspective, that they actually thought at some point they actually they may lose the, the war, particularly after the Tet Offensive, where they suffered all those losses. I, I couldn't quite hear the the failings in the war. Is that what you said? No, no. What I what I was asking was whether or not you found any Vietnamese officers or, or people that appear on the show as to whether or not any of them uh, came forward and were willing to say, wait a second, there was a moment during this entire process where we thought we were actually going to lose. For example, maybe after the Tet Offensive when they suffered all those losses or any point during the well, course they of that certainly, event. Well, they certainly say that it was, um, that nothing went as they had planned and that they lost enormous numbers of people. Um, I, 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 I think... I think it would be very hard for them to say that we, that I thought we were going to lose. I don't, I, I, I think they just felt they were destined to win eventually. They were going to grind us down as they had ground down the, the French. And they did. So, but I, I don't think we have anyone who says quite that. Yes. Hi, I've seen the first five episodes, and my reaction so far has been has been anger, as, especially listening to Johnson and McNamara's conversations and condemning all those men to death when they knew the war wasn't winnable, and they knew for years. I mean, that really made me angry, and I wondered if you could maintain your dispassionate historians. Um, viewpoint while you were working on it or whether you got a little angry too? I got angry too. It's impossible not to be angry about it. I mean, I, you know, and, it, and it's made worse in some ways because 
the two presidents involved uh, foolishly recorded themselves. <laughs> I'm sure all presidents have done things we'd be embarrassed to hear, even, even yours, certainly mine. <laughs> but uh, uh, to hear them actually doing it makes you mad. You can't help it. You just feel, you feel betrayed. And when you look at, you know, that, that wonderful kid who died, that we, you know, we, we followed Mo, that kid named Mogi Crocker and his wonderful family. Uh, just the idea that they were there on such a fool's errand with such high spirit, and it, it's very hard to watch. Bill, did you have a question? Can someone come down with a mic? Thank you. Hi, Bill. <laughs> Jeff, thank you for that extraordinary evening and for this extraordinary work. I just want to say a couple words, one of them about Franklin Roosevelt. Franklin Roosevelt left no doubt in his mind that the age of colonialism was over. This was his attitude before World War II. He had dinner with the French ambassador in 1938 and strongly advised the French to establish, as we did with the Philippines, an autonomous link so that by a date certain Vietnam would be a free and independent country. And he pursued this point of view all through the war years. His death, one of the real tragedies of his death, was that the group that succeeded him decided that they had to hold the French Empire together right. in order to prevent France from being communist in Europe, which was an extraordinary tragedy. I would just say also, I spent two years in Vietnam and Thailand in 1953-54, when the French were still there as assistant to General Donovan, who was our ambassador. In the Dien Bien Phu crisis, which I was a party to at least as a note taker, one of the major considerations was whether nuclear weapons should be used. And Nixon, as vice president, and Radford, as the then chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, were advocating it. The strong participant who discouraged Eisenhower from doing anything was Lyndon Johnson, in many ways. Johnson was Eisenhower's ally in, in, in doing that. But you're so right how little we knew. And we were out there. I mean, to find someone who understood a relationship between China and Vietnam was impossible to find. And we were talking about the domino theory without understanding that for hundreds of years, the Chinese and the Vietnamese were bitter, bitter enemies, which they then revealed again. I think the, uh, last, one last point I'd like to make. One of the important things about this that I've not seen before is having the Vietnamese tell their side of the story it makes a very different presentation in terms of the picture. And the fact that they spoke so candidly and frankly mm -hmm. was, it was truly remarkable. I mean, Eisenhower's role, I hope, will be carefully examined because Eisenhower was constantly pressing Kennedy and the years, months before the inauguration that Laos, for example, yeah. was an absolute primary obligation of the United States and we had to do that. And the last point I've made, one of the most poignant pictures of the whole series that I've seen so far is that of Bob Beckmanbera sitting in alone mm. in that room. And then he sends the note to Johnson, which essentially says, give up, this is over. And Johnson just dismisses him, puts him over into the World Bank and you know here. But then he appoints Clark Clifford, who publicly advocated all the positions Johnson did, but who from the telephone calls from Johnson immediately after President Kennedy's death, Clark Clifford was an opponent of anything to do in Vietnam and wrote an extraordinary memorandum to yep. that effect. So when he becomes Secretary of Defense in 1968, he carries out his positions yep. rather than, and Johnson gives to it, doesn't even comment on it. It's just interesting comment. So. Yep. By the way, before the next question, just a brief commercial word. Stay tuned, all of you who are on our lists, for news of when Bill Vanden Heuvel is going to appear here and talk about that relationship with Wild Bill Donovan that I don't think anyone else can report on. So we're, stay tuned for a date. Yeah. Um,
Yes, this gentleman here. Quickly share a reaction to the film that it's, a, it's I think, a unique perspective. My son is a young uh, diplomat in who uh, shuttles between um, Cambodia and Vietnam, <coughs> and uh, trained in foreign policy and so on and so forth. But um, I'm getting reactions from him and from a number of his colleagues and uh, the young group. Um, it it explains almost retroactively so much about the personality and the attitudes and the reactions of people they meet. Uh, it's, this, will, this will have a place in, in training for, for a long time uh, for people who, who, who go there. Um, uh, uh, not so much the facts, because they've read up the wazoo, but, they, uh, <laughs> but the sort of texture and the, the rages and the angers, but also this, why was it that they were able to overcome American power? This, you know, sorry. The interesting final point is that um, a number of these people are like calling back to their home, to, to their parents, one of them is me, saying, so now I know what was going on back then. Mm -hmm. And this has been the stunning revelation for me and for some of my friends whose sons and daughters also work with, is he said, well, you know a lot about this, so what do you think, Dad? I said, I just realized watching this that because I was so terrified, hmm. I was 1A just as Nixon ended the draft. And we were so terrified that even we were, those of us studying international relations were paying no attention to it because that's where you went to die. Mm -hmm. You know, so I'm just, I am learning <laughs> more than I should be learning. <laughs> that I should have known for quite a while, but this it, this this was a, a traumatic place that I didn't want to know that much about it. I just knew that m members of my high school class, their names were starting to build up. Sure. You know, um, uh, what I didn't mention was we have done a, a Vietnamese version of this, uh -huh. translated, and uh, it is being streamed in Vietnam and the number of, as I understand it, the number of people streaming it there is almost as high as the number of people streaming it here. Isn't that amazing? That is extraordinary. Yeah. I've been ignoring this side. Is that because they're in? The mic is working on this side. Right? Peter, do you have a? I was uh, a journalist in Vietnam. Right. Subsequently edited both McNamara and Clifford. So I think. I'm entitled to a point of view. Um, <laughs> you said that what journalists did was not the first rough draft of history, but in fact just things that happened. Mm -hmm. I'll take umbrage at that. Okay. <laughs> I'll take significant umbrage right. at that. In fact, the journalism of that period was really quite extraordinary. And oh, that's the, absolutely true. One of the reasons was that it was unlike any war before or since. There was no censorship. We could go anywhere. We wrote anything we wanted. And the truth is, we conveyed to the public in a way that is really quite remarkable what was going on. There was a deep belief up and down the line from the President of the United States to the reporters and the GIs that the mandate of heaven was on the other side. Mm -hmm. There was never any doubt about that. The reasons that we stayed in Vietnam, it seems to me, were... Uh, because of the World War II memory, because of the sense that the Soviets and Chinese were on the march and so on. And it was obviously wrong, but everybody knew it was wrong. And part of the irony of that war is that we knew it was wrong, we fought the war, we ended the war, we left, and if you go back today to Vietnam, no one on either side can really explain what it was about. Mm -hmm. It made no sense whatsoever. And that, I think, is the great tragedy. It was a war without purpose, mm -hmm. ultimately. I, I want to say I agree with everything you said about journalism. All I meant was, uh, no matter how good it is, there is stuff you can't possibly know, which you learn later. That's all I'm, I'm that's, yeah. That's I mean, the film is, you know, Neil Sheehan is on screen. And uh, Joe Galloway. And, and Joe. Lawrence, and, oh, yeah, sure. And, uh, yeah, and God knows I couldn't have done the book without all the stuff that all those people wrote. Yeah, yeah.
I didn't mean to. <laughs> In back. Um, I haven't had a chance to watch the documentary documentary series, but um, I'm just curious. Does it cover the Miley massacre that occurred during the Vietnam War? Me lie. Does it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. I was just curious. That's all. Yeah, we do. Yes. We're giving we're giving our mic run or workout. Sorry. Thank you so much because I know we have people upstairs probably. Um, gentlemen, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, I just wanted to ask a little bit more about the decision. Was it a decision not to speak with Henry Kissinger? And is you know, just as you looked at perhaps the possible availability of some of the principles sort of still among us, um, was there, it's just say a little bit more about that. Sure, if you, I, uh, if you have Henry Kissinger, you have to have somebody who will tell you what he's, <laughs> to put him in context. <laughs> And that requires uh, either somebody uh, of his stature, and, and there are very few people who are alive, you know, um, or a historian who was going to argue. And then it becomes an argument. And I just, we didn't want, there, the whole war is an argument. We didn't want to have the, you know, have those battles. Um, there was a film that uh, Rory Kennedy made, um, which is, has fabulous footage, and uh, it seems to me a sort of crazy version of, of the war in which uh, if we'd only sent them some more tanks, as Neil Sheehan says, some more furniture, um, uh, they would have won. They wouldn't have won. And, uh, but Kissinger and Ford wanted it to be the Congress's fault that, that we didn't <coughs> come to the rescue at the end. And um, we didn't want to, it's just hard to avoid getting into that kind of justifying argument. Yeah. Yes, right, right close by. Hi. Um, it's interesting, I think a lot of times the documentaries, one of, this, one of the comments that everybody has about most of them is that they aren't long enough. <laughs> you know, that, you know, people always want more. What this was left out, that was left out. Like last night, I thought there'd be more about Kaysan than there wasn't. Mm. But so I guess my the question I I have is why start in 1858? Why did why was it decided to leave out this kind of the history with the Chinese of thousands oh. of years of their you know fighting against even the Chinese and that relationship, which of course we were unaware of as as a government at the time. Um, well, in the original, <laughs> the original script, there was some of that. Um, there's a point beyond which you, it's awful hard to get a general audience to stick with things that happened a very long time ago in another place. I mean, it's just hard. Um, also, as I understand the latest scholarship, there's a, that, a lot of that anti-Chinese, um, there's a sort of mythology about it. Vietnam itself is only uh, is younger than we are. They, there was never a Vietnam as Vietnam until the late 18th century. So uh, it, it's not quite as simple as it was. There, there, there are a lot of <clears throat> a lot of early books by people who were just getting into this about this thousands of years, and it's and it's a great myth in in Vietnam. But as I understand more modern scholarship, it's more complicated than that. A lot of Chinese, of Vietnamese culture is really Chinese culture, from chopsticks to food to, you know. Um, so it's a complicated relationship, and we just didn't have time. Uh, believe it or not, at 18 hours, we didn't have time. <laughs> time is our enemy. So we have one more. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I actually was a foreign service officer posted in Vietnam uh, eight years ago. I spent a year speak learning Vietnamese and two years in Ho Chi Minh City, Saigon. Um, and the thing that I still cannot wrap my head around, and even while watching uh, the series, is how the domino theory was accepted as true. 
Um, can you give any more context to why that was such a, a, a held are, belief? Asians are all alike. <laughs> I mean, that's basically what that is. That's, that's uh, you know, they're all kind of funny people and, and, and uh, they're not dependable and uh, they're not British or French anymore. So they're probably going to go, I mean, it, it's really simple-minded. I don't, I don't think, I know. I, I see you shaking your head. And I, listen, I, lived, I grew up in India. I know how stupid this is. But it, it, um, I'm old enough to remember John Foster Dulles getting off a plane at Palm Airport in New Delhi and saying with his wife, I can't remember his wife's name, we'll say Ruth. Ruth and I are always happy to be in New Delhi. <laughs> which is how it's pronounced in Ohio. <laughs> and that gives you a Don't sense of, of the knowledge of what we were dealing with. I'm going to relent because this gentleman looks very intriguing. Sir. I'm going to have him do his last question. Wait, wait for the mic, though. I was a young Air Force veteran in 1962, and I came home just before the Bay of... Uh, just before the... the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. In fact, uh, the first time I ever saw Kennedy on television, as he was speaking, the planes were flying in over my house to land mm. in Opelika, Florida, to you know, move on down to Key West. But my point is that I was stationed in Italy, where we had uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles aimed at Russia from 1960 to 1962. And we understood the domino theory because there was the problem that Kennedy had with, with Khrushchev when, in, in 1960. There was the, the building of the Berlin Wall in 1961. There was the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. So when, when the word came out about the domino theory in, in Southeast Asia, it was not an alien theory. It was something that we were familiar with because, in fact, the missiles that we put into southern Italy were put in to counteract the 85% part of the population of southern Italy that voted communist in 1960. Mm -hmm. So we put in missiles. The Russians turned around and pulled in the steel plant, which put the southern Italians to work. And the number of voters went up to, for the communists went up to about 90%. But we, we were certainly aware of the concept of the, of, the dominant, of the domino. Well, for those whose, whose interest is only piqued by this discussion or by the hours they've seen. I hear there are a thousand books at the Strand Bookshop that are available. <laughs> there are. Many but, of them with my notes in them. <laughs> but if you want a fabulous synthesis, you will join us upstairs where our guests will be signing copies of the formidable book. Yes. More than a companion book. It weighs more than pounds. a picture book. <laughs> um, Come up and see uh, our, our, one of our great favorites, Dr. Lamazow, has donated uh, a number of Vanity Fair covers in all art styles showing Franklin D. Roosevelt. If you want to just come from this moment and get a dose of optimism and hope, you'll enjoy those. Uh, I thank you all for being here, and we thank Jeff. Thank you. Thank you.